What's going to happen now is the first of the uh, the big presentations we've got for you over this weekend, and I guarantee you this is going to be good entertainment for you. I've seen this before, and uh, it's amazing. It draws you in. I'm sure you're going to enjoy yourselves. Now I'm going to hand over to someone who's got the real knowledge of what Chitty Chitty Bang Bang really was. Not just the flying car, everything else that goes with it. And we're really, really grateful for him to come here to the Sunbeam Alpine National here in Kent, give up his time to do this. So without any further ado, I'd like to say Billy Hollis, ladies and gentlemen. Right, okay, well, my name is Billy, as Tim has mentioned, thank you. And a warm welcome to all you Sunbeam Alpine people. For what I hope will be an interesting story. Now, most of you know the film Chitty. And uh, I hope you can see some of this. Uh, it's not the best, best style of view we've got, but uh, there, in fact, is a thing about the original film Chitty, Chitty, Bang Bang. And everybody knows about that, don't they? And uh, this, uh, this film was about a magical car. It was actually started by a book published in 1964. And the film came to our screens with a star-studded cast back in 1968. But where did the name Chitty Chitty Bang Bang come from? Was there ever a real car with this name or only a fictitious magical one? Uh, will you alpine lovers make yourselves comfortable? We'll begin. Our story starts, believe it or not, in... Where's that? Anybody know? Poland. Did someone say Poland? Right, I think they should have a free raffle ticket or something. For them. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and it starts in Poland during the 17th century, long time ago. A gentleman called Albert Zabriski, born in 1638, could not see a future in his homeland. And being a bit of an adventurer, decided to move to America, to New Amsterdam, now called New York. And he went there in 1662. Well, he drifted around for some years, doing all manner of jobs. But then settled down, set down roots in what is now Jersey City in New Jersey. Land in this country could be claimed by anyone prepared to work it, and Albert laid claim to wherever he settled, plus large areas of adjoining land. By 1675, he decided to step back from working the land and look for a wife. <clears throat> he was 38 years old, fit, strong, and he fell for a lovely girl from Holland called Matilda van der Linden. No photos, unfortunately, not many cameras in the 17th century. They were married in 1676. More property was acquired, mainly from native Indians, and thus started a line of descendants that became among the largest property owners in the whole of the East of America. The next five generations increased the property portfolio considerably, and one Martin Zabriskie, born in 1821, had truly amazing wealth. Some people estimate as high as $10 million. Martin decided to change the family name to Zabriskie, and it was, as it was more distinguished than Zabriskie. He also felt he should have a title. And we know he did return to Poland and obtained what was called a patent of nobility. He became a count. In other words, he bought a title. I wonder what that cost him. I will point out that no one has actually found evidence that he ever was a real count. But there again, who was going to challenge such a wealthy, influential man who owned most of New York? He married a young lady called Anna, in 1850, she came from a wealthy landowning family. More wealth. Well, they do say that money goes to money, don't they? They had four children. The third child, born in 1855, was one William 
Eliot. He was always called Eliot. And he is the father of the real Chitty Chitty Bang Bang hero. <laughs> Living a truly high flying life, reveling in the family wealth, Eliot married one Margaret Astor. Yes, the Astor family. So Zabrowski wealth increased even more. In 1895, their son, Count Louis Zorro Zabrowski, was born in Mayfair, London, into a family with more wealth than any Rockefeller or Trump family today. Uh, this is Louis's mum, the former Miss Astor. Earlier in 1886, Elliot arrived in England. Elliot set up home in Mayfair. And another in, where do you think that is? Melton Mowbray, famous for pork pies. Right. Although he had everything in America, he wanted to be accepted into the British aristocracy. And indeed he was. Also, he loved the sport of fox hunting and the British way of country life. Among Eliot's friends and associates were Gottlieb Daimler. Uh, we in this country refer to him as Daimler, but he's Daimler. Gottlieb Daimler. Also, Carl Benz, a name I'm sure you've heard before. And from France, Albert de Dion, Monsieur de Dion. Well, what a gang. A true bunch of early 20th century piston heads with SAE 30 oil running through their veins. Another of his contemporaries, Wilhelm Maybach. That's him in the white suit, sitting in the car. He liked to be different. Notice he has a white suit. No one else would have worn a white suit in those days. He was the brilliant German engineer who built aero engines for Zeppelins and other early aircraft. Elliot Zabrowski, there's a good picture of him, raced motor cars with a passion, mainly Mercedes, all over Europe. One of his closest rivals was the famous French motorman, Monsieur Marcel Renault. Okay. And sadly, as for Elliot, it all ended on April the 1st, 1903. There he is about to set off on a hill climb near Nice in France. But unfortunately, he crashed. And that's what the car looked like. His body was brought back to England and buried at a church of St. James Burton Lazar's which, of course, was the church near Belton Mowbray. There it is. He was only 48 years old. He left his widow Margaret some £2.8 million. Pounds. Value today? Around £240 million. Pounds. So, Margaret and, his son, and her son, young Louis, settled in Bridge near Canterbury, just down the road, not far away. And in 1906, and soon after, they purchased a magnificent Georgian mansion nearby called Hyam Park. And there it is, what a place, fantastic. Set in 225 acres of land. Margaret sadly did not enjoy good health. She passed away in 1911, aged 58. Louis was just 16 years old, an orphan, but an incredibly rich one. <clears throat> Margaret was buried in the churchyard near Melton Mowbray next to her husband, Elliot. So now Louis, yet another Zaborowski with SAE 30 running in his veins. And boy, was he going to make a mark on the British motor racing scene. However, there were a few legal problems concerning Margaret's will. But Louis finally inherited everything at the age of 21. <laughs> And there he is at the wheel of a Mercedes, one of his favourite cars. 
So, Lou, he was always called Lou by all his friends and contemporaries, so we're going to call him Lou from now on. Lou had no need to work, but following a public school education at Eton, he became totally immersed in motor cars. He had a state-of-the-art workshop set up at Higham, and played the part of a rich, titled playboy. Two days before his 24th birthday, he married a 22-year-old actress called Violet Lester, or Vi, as she was always known. Right, at this point, I will point out something. For a member of the elite aristocracy to marry a girl who was on the stage was not the thing to do. Many heads were turned, many mumblings were heard, but Lou, he didn't give a damn. Their life together at Higham was cars, fun, high society, social events, and explosions. Very often he would invite his hooray Henry pals from London. As they arrived, he would set off explosive charges he planted either side of the long drive up to Higham, and he scared them half to death. Then, after copious amounts of booze, they would leap into a few of Lou's many cars and race down the A2 to Dover and back, breaking every speed limit and every traffic law imaginable. It was on one such hair-raising trip that Lou, at the wheel of one of his high-speed cars, noticed he was being chased by a young man on a rudge multi-motorcycle. That young man was my father. Well, keen to follow his father's footsteps, Lou knew about Brooklands, Brooklands Racetrack in Surrey, the home of British motor racing in the Roaring Twenties. 1921 saw Lou take Brooklands by storm, winning two races and coming second in a third. The car, chitty, chitty, bang, bang. A monster indeed, with a straight six, 23-litre Maybach aero engine, fitted into a lengthened Mercedes chassis. There it is again. Lou's driving experience, combined with the power of Chitty Bang Bang, was incredible and unbeatable. So why the name? Well, some say it was the sound of the massive engine being started. A man would crank the engine, the driver would wind a magneto on the dashboard. When it was about to start, it would spin over and back far, making a noise like chitty, 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 bang, bang. Good explanation, but not true. Some say it was the sound of the huge engine idling, and because the ignition systems were not as they are today, in fact they weren't even like the 1960s in your car, Backfiring would happen. Good explanation, but not true again. Okay, I've talked about some of the events at the beginning of the 20th century, but I've not mentioned the mo most momentous event, the Great War. The First World War, 1914-1918, was supposedly the war to end wars, and how we all wish that had been true. Thousands of British and other soldiers went to what is known as the Western Front, trenches in France or Belgium, and the casualty figures were horrendous. However, we know for a fact that these brave soldiers suffering the terrible conditions of the trenches were given some rest and recuperation time. But to qualify for such relief, the men had to obtain permission. And if granted, they will receive a signed leave permit, or chit, or chitty. Where did these poor soldiers go? Far away from the trenches as possible, within the time they had. And that meant gay Paris. The bustling city, with its life and lights, was a far cry from the trenches. The young ladies <clears throat> that frequented the Pigalle area of the city would certainly give our soldiers a great time. 
in return for some French francs. So the activity of travelling to Paris with a leave permit and indulging in some joyous activity with a <coughs> young French lady became the subject of a rather bawdy song, frequently sung by the men when they got back to the trenches. Among the dubious lyrics of this song were the words Chitty Bang Bang. I will say no more, this is a family show after all. Okay, Lou knew of this song and found it quite amusing. A great name for my racing car, he thought. So now you all know the real origin of the name. Nothing at all to do with engine sounds. Rather, a very bawdy First World War song. Okay, so now, why was the book and film so named? The story was about a magical and completely fictitious car that could fly. The film featured such characters as the child catcher, remember him? Could do with him around today sometimes, couldn't we? Who operated a fairy tale castle, Neuschwanstein, which is in the heart of Bavaria, and the former home of Mad King Ludwig of Bavaria. The film had absolutely nothing to do with Lou and the monster racing car of the 1920s. Or did it? The children's story, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, was written by one Ian Fleming. That's right, the same Fleming who wrote the James Bond stories. So let's come back to Lou and Chitty Bang Bang a little later and take a look at Ian Fleming. Born in 1908, in Mayfair, London, well-educated, slightly eccentric, wealthy, he was indeed much like Lou, and very much like the character he created, James Bond. As a boy of 14, Fleming had seen Lou race Chitty Bang Bang at Brooklands, and probably saw a Chitty on the roads of East Kent in the 1930s. One thing for sure, he never forgot the name. You see, Fleming lived for many years in East Kent at a beachfront house at St. Margaret's Bay. And there it is, beautiful house. He bought it from the famous actor Noel Coward in the 1950s. And his life in my part of the world had a great influence on him. Bond, Bond's number was 007. But where did Fleming get the number from? Well, believe it or not, <laughs> it was from a bus, or coach to be more precise. Bond's number 007 was the number of the London to Dover coach. And here it is today. Much of the content of the Bond book, Moonraker, is centred around St Margaret's Bay and Kingstown. That's a village very close to St Margaret's between sort of Dover and Deal. And you remember the film Moonraker? Remember this interesting character? I'm sure we all do, yeah. Indeed, in Moonraker the book, Bond chases the villain, Sir Hugo Drax, down the Dover Road. Exactly reminiscent of Lou's liking for the A2 when racing his weekend pals from Higham to Dover and back. Well, not the first Bond novel. Dr. No was the first Bond story turned into a film in 1962. And what was the first film Bond car? Now, that's woken you all up, hasn't it? You know, you've actually seen a picture of a Sunbeam Alpine. So if you haven't seen enough out there already. A Sunbeam Alpine, indeed. This photo is taken not long ago at the NEC. Is, is Pauline still here? Is she into it? There she is. This is the lady at the front of the picture. No, oh, you're very welcome. I don't suppose you've seen the picture for a little while, but there we go. What a lovely picture and a fabulous bomb car indeed. Certainly, the Sunby Melpine was the car Bond used in this first film. Amazing. So, back to Lou. 
While the first aero engine monster was bracing at Brooklands, the second was made. Chitty 2, as we call it. It was another pre-war Mercedes chassis with a straight six aero engine installed. But this was a Benz engine, much smaller, only 19 litres. <laughs> a four-seater body was coach built by Bly Brothers, a coach builder in Canterbury in Kent. Uh, but this chitty only raced on one occasion at Brooklands, where it lapped at nearly 105 miles an hour. Then Chitty 3 came along. This was another aero engine Mercedes, which Lou always referred to as the white Mercedes. It was a smaller car again, with a 14.7 litre engine, straight six. But this car raced at Brooklands and actually achieved over 120 miles per hour. Worthy of mention is the fact that Lou and White Vi did a trip to the south of France. They crossed over to North Africa and actually ventured into the Sahara Desert. The car? Chitty 2. Now that was their transport. Well, Chitty 3 was the baggage car. Vi obviously has an awful lot of baggage, didn't she? So there's the two of them together just before they plunged into the desert. Chitty 4 was never actually completed in Lou's lifetime. In fact, some historians say the car should not be branded Chitty, as Lou always referred to it as the Hyam Special. This was Lou's largest car, with a 450 horsepower V12 aero engine of 27 litres. We will return to this amazing car a bit later. Okay, Lou's racing career was sadly a short one, but having started in 1921, the years that followed were full of motor racing and travelling everywhere. He even went to America in 1923, and there competed in the Indianapolis 500 race, driving no less a car than a Bugatti. Here is the actual car with Lou sitting in it. However, it appears that his favoured fav favored cars were those from the Mercedes stable. Maybe because of his father's racing experience, or the fact that Chitties were all based on cars from this famous mark. In fact, his love and admiration for Mercedes led him to drive Chitty 3 to Stuttgart, the home of Mercedes, in early 1924 to negotiate joining the official Mercedes racing team. Right, we come to the sad part of our story. Lou is driving for Mercedes and the 1924 Italian Grand Prix at Monza in Italy is fast approaching. In October of that year, Lou travelled to Monza and was ready to compete. He was no stranger to the Italian track, having competed there the previous year, driving an all-American Miller car, a Miller 122, a much lighter car than the Chitties and technically far more advanced. This car was capable of speeds of over 140 miles an hour. Little did Lou know that the Monza Grand Prix would be his last ever race, a tragedy was about to happen. He crashed his white Mercedes too later. A worked prepared racing car, a superb piece of automobile engineering designed by no less than the great Dr. Ferdinand Porsche. The car had skidded and it ploughed into a tree. Lou was taken to Monza Hospital, but his injuries were such that he did not survive. Lou was just 29 years old. The other works Mercedes cars were withdrawn from the race as a mark of respect. Lou's body was returned to England and his final resting place, and there is actually his uh, stone over his grave, um, was in fact in the church that you uh, saw earlier. And he was in fact 
buried by his parents, and they are the graves of Eliot and uh, Margaret at the churchyard in St. James Church near Milton Mowbray. The grave is surrounded by a fence. Can you, can you see that one? And um, we took this photo a few years back and it, it really is a little bit unkempt, but of course there are no Zabrowski's left in the country to look after it. But it's still there. So, let's take a look at what happened following the tragic demise of the legendary Count Louis Zaborowski and the fate of the Chitties. During his lifetime, Lou had established a small-scale railway that ran round the grounds of Higham Park. Because as well as, as well as cars, Lou was passionate about railways. Together with a close friend, another millionaire, <clears throat> Captain Howie, Lou had planned a 15-inch gauge railway for public use. He'd already ordered two magnificent steam locomotives from David Paxman in Essex. These were one-third full-size locomotives. They were named Northern Star and Green Goddess. Captain Howie was left with two locomotives and the Zabrowski dream of a full-blown one-third size working railway. But where? Well, where else? But the wonderful flat landscape of Romney Marsh, sometimes known as the Seventh Continent, and inhabited mainly by sheep. In 1927, the Romney, Hyde and Dimchurch Railway opened to the public, with the track being extended from High through to Great Stone in 1928. Today, it is a tourist attraction, a working railway used by thousands of visitors. Thank you, Lou. You know, I do thoroughly recommend a visit to this railway. And when you get to Dungeness, you get an excellent fish and chip lunch. That is Dungeness. It is sometimes said when the Lord created the earth, the last place he did was Dungeness. Now, Lou's wife, Vi, sold higher and eventually went to the USA. She married again, her second husband being one Mr. Pat Singer, the grandson of Paris Singer, who operated a company manufacturing sewing machines. Once more, we see money going to money. So let us return to Lou's cars. Chitty won, but the first monster cars created by Lou Lou's friend and founder of the Light Railway across Romney Marsh, Captain Howie, acquired Chitty One and ran it once at Brooklands. It passed into the hands of Adrian Conan Doyle and his brother, the sons of Arthur, Sir Arthur, the famous creator of the great fictional detective Sherlock Holmes. Eventually, Chitty One was broken up and bought for spare parts by one John Morris. Now I've got to say we know nothing about John Morris whatsoever, but he was nothing to do with Morris Motors, started by William Morris, Lord Nuffield. Chitty Three, the white Mercedes, had been Lou's personal transport, and as I mentioned, he'd driven this car to Stuttgart when he negotiated with Mercedes to join their team. A fantastic car indeed, and far more advanced technically than the previous two titties. The car found a new owner, one Clive Windsor Richards, after Lou's death, a Brooklyn's racing driver who had known Lou well. Sadly, Mr Windsor Richards hit financial problems, and to help solve his sad predicament, Chitty 3 was sold to one George Larnell Seymour, <clears throat> Viscount Carlo. And that was in about 1937. Viscount Carlo was a wealthy and gifted aristocrat. He spoke nine languages and played a significant role in the wartime intelligence services. Most of his work and activities were very hush hush. We don't even have a photograph of him. He was also a Second World War pilot, but sadly died in 1944 on a top 
secret mission. Here was a real James Bond character who seems to fit rather well into this Chitty story. Nothing is known of the fate of Chitty 3. Well, I guess that would give me something to do, find out what happened to Chitty 3. Okay, so now to Chitty 4. The car was called by Lou as, a, Lou, as I mentioned, the Hyam Special, and it was very special. Unfinished at the time of Lou's death, the car was completed by Lou's close friend and fellow racing enthusiast, Clive Gallup. Gallup was a brilliant engineer and a pioneer of early military flying. He flew aircraft over the Western Front during the First World War. A friend of fellow engineer W.O. Bentley. This was another man with SAE 30 running through his veins. Gallup designed the first engines for Bentley Motors. He was a racing driver as well as a brilliant engineer and joined forces with our Lou in 1921. <coughs> Clive was involved in the production of all the Chitty cars. Gallup and Lou went on many escapades together. Some say they were inseparable. Here they are, together, practicing for the first Junior Car Club 200 mile race in October. 1921 in an Aston Monty. Ah, perhaps I forgot to mention, Lou was an early patron and stakeholder of Aston Martin. I'm sure he would have approved of the Goldfinger DB5. Okay, so back to Chitty 4. This, as I've told you, was a monster car, 450 horsepower. Engines don't come much bigger than that, do they? The 1920s were land speed record chasing years, and Chitty 4, now in the hands of one J.G. Perry Thomas, a brilliant engine designer and racing driver, took the land speed record in April 1926 at a recorded speed of 171.2 miles per hour. Perry Thomas had renamed the car Babs and carried out extensive engine and body modifications before his land speed record attempt. This incredible speed record was set at Pendine Sands in Wales. However, the record was short-lived as one Malcolm Campbell driving the famous Napier Campbell Bluebird became the record holder less than a year later. So, Harry Thomas returned to Pendine Sands in 1927 in an attempt to regain the title. Tragically, he was killed on his second run. And as a mark of respect, Banks was buried in Pendine Sands. However, Campbell's record was then beaten by one Sir Henry Seagrave, a former land speed record holder but now became the driver of the first car to achieve a speed of 200 miles per hour. And what did he drive? Are you ready for this? A Sunbeam! Wow! Seagrave Sunbeam had slightly more power than your Elfons. He had 1,000 brake horsepower. Seagrave's earlier records were also in some beams. The 1926 record was achieved in a, you all know the name, of a Sunbeam Tiger. And that car was called a Sunbeam Tiger. This car had the smallest engine capacity of all land speed record holders, only four litres. There it is, Sunbeam clearly showing on the bonnet. However, it was capable of over 150 miles an hour, and there it is today, it still exists, and it's still capable of 150 miles per hour. So, back to Babs, or Chitty 4. Was that the end of the car, lying there, buried at Pendine Sands? Certainly not. In 1969, the car was exhumed and restored. Here it is, at the National Motor Museum, duly. And the car is still up and running today. Interesting to note that after being buried for over 40 years, the engine was still in remarkable condition. 
and the spark plugs, made of course by Champion, still function perfectly. Champion featured this in the advertising of the time. I wonder if the N9Y champions in your alpines would last as long. Well, I'm sure they would. <clears throat> so, one chitty still survives, albeit in a very different guise to how our hero Lewin built it back in the 1920s. Now, those of you who are still awake <coughs> might have noticed there's been no mention of Chitty 2. Well, Chitty 4, or the High M Special, or Babs, is still around as mentioned. But Chitty 2 still exists, yes, and it is still as Count Zabrowski built it. Following Lou's untimely demise in 1924, Chitty 2 was cared for by Clive Gallup, his friend, for a while, and then passed into the hands of one Bunty Scott Moncrief, a purveyor of horseless carriages to the nobility and gentry. Bunty had been very much part of the 1920s motor racing scene. He had motor garage premises in London, and in the late 1920s, he had two close friends. One, Richard Little, known affectionately as Goldfish, and my father, William Hollis. So, this dubious trio of Bunty, Goldfish and Bill got up to all sorts of antics, some highly questionable. <clears throat> I know they spent the night in the cells of a Folkestone police station following the theft of a policeman's helmet. My father told me nothing of this. I met Goldfish in 1969 and he spilled the beans. So my father did a deal with Bunty and purchased Chitty too, paying some £300 and part exchanging a Hillman Aero Minx. My father was then running a motor coach business from Dover. In fact, his great claim to fame was that he drove the first ever long distance coach from Dover to London. <laughs> Little did he know, he was the forerunner of 007. Chitty too came to Dover and he did a fair bit of engine work, which was carried out by two expert mechanics known to Bunty. There they are. Stalwart gentlemen indeed. They stayed at my grandfather's house called Woodville Hall until the restoration work was finished in the early 1930s. Here is the finished Chitty outside Woodville Hall. Doesn't she look absolutely grand? And that was the, high, the, the, the highlight of my father's life when that photo was taken. Chitty fully restored, looking magnificent. He drove Chitty throughout the 1930s, usually to impress friends, and in particular, young ladies. <clears throat> one such young lady was one Mickey Armstead from Margate, and she became my mother. When asked of the Chitty experience, she said she refused to go in the car again. And so one experience with my father driving the monster was utterly terrifying. Okay, in 1939, the world was once again plunged into war with Germany. And very soon, Dover became well involved due to the town's location. Bombs, shells, doodlebugs, they all happened. Dover really suffered, and Chitty had been in a garage belonging to a good friend of my father. A woodruff key had sheared. Now, you see where the big sprocket wheel is with the chain that goes to the back wheel? Well, right in the centre of that was a woodruff key, and that was a very, very weak part of this motor car. It often happened. That had sheared, so for, there was no drive whatsoever. This had sheared, and Chitty wasn't going anywhere until the repair was carried out. My father, fearing the heavy bombardment of Dover was suffering, had Chitty towed out to his farm near a village called Sutton, some six miles out of town. 
and Chitty was housed there in a bomb. As the war progressed, <laughs> the need for using that bomb for farming purposes was obvious. So Chitty was pushed into the yard and covered with a big tarpaulin. There she stayed and was seriously neglected for a long, long time. But in 1946, a young friend of my father's, a chap called Peter, asked if he could purchase the car as he was keen to renovate it to its former glory. My father refused to sell it, but allowed Peter to tow it to a garage in Deal on the express proviso that it should not be sold. Father kept the logbook, an important document in those days, and said that if Peter wanted to ever dispose of the car, father should be informed. You see, my father's major concern was that the car should never leave this country. City too was a piece of local history, and above all, she should never end up in America. Life continued. But as we've already mentioned, the children's book, Chitty Bang Bang, was released in 1964. The film followed in 68. Chitty 2, now superbly renovated by Peter, became a local star, appearing at local fates and events. She even completed in the Brighton Speed Trials. In 1969, it became known that Chitty 2 was to be sold at a vintage car auction in Olympia, London and would almost certainly be bought by an American. Peter had not stuck to the deal done with my father, which had been sealed by a handshake over the kitchen table. Correspondence ensued, but the car was set to be auctioned in July. Matters became serious, and who should appear in the midst of all this? Me! Right? I contacted him, Lord Montague of Bewley, who agreed to fund legal action to stop the sale of the car on the understanding that the car would then reside at the National Motor Museum Bewley forevermore. But until the hammer had gone down and Chitty had been sold, the original arrangement with my father had not been broken by Peter. So, the day of the auction came, word had got out that there was going to be an attempt to stop the sale. So, in return for agreeing to write a series of articles about the car, I was smuggled into Olympia by the motoring correspondent of the Daily Mirror. Gosh, what an experience, I remember it well. All these wealthy, important people, newspaper reporters, and more vintage and veteran cars for sale than you could shake a stick at. And there, at the centrepiece, was Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Here I am, standing next to her. You will immediately recognise me, of course, because I haven't changed a bit. It was there that I had a very lengthy conversation with one Inspector Cluzeau, a.k.a. Peter Sellers. Sellers bought a couple of Jaguar XK120s to add to his already large collection of Jaguar XKs. Okay, so the auction for Chitty started and the hammer fell when one Harry Resnick from New York bid £15,500. Now this is 1969. Immediately, amidst all the applause and excitement, I approached both Peter who had sold the car, thus breaking the agreement with my father, and Resnick, who had bought the car. I told them both that injunctions would be served on them to stop the car from leaving the country. I was rapidly taken out of Olympia, hotly pursued by the paparazzi. So I, my father, and Lord Montague and his lawyers then set about preparing the case and it came to court in 1970, at which time, sadly, Lord Montague's QC thought it might be in his Lordship's financial interest to reach a settlement. And that, regrettably, is what happened. And Chitty left these shores and headed for New York. Multi-millionaire Resnick had a motorman museum in Ellenville, near New York. 
What happened to Chitty after the closure of this museum is, is a bit vague. But she found her way to New Mexico and then to Cleveland, Ohio, where she was housed in the Crawford Auto Aviation Museum. It now becomes interesting because one of the trustees of the Crawford Auto Aviation Museum is none other than Lord Montague of Bewley. His Lordship negotiated the return of Chitty for a temporary display in Bewley in 1992. And I got in touch with his Lordship, who was delighted to hear from me, and invited me to Bewley to see Chitty before she was exhibited. Here I am in the workshop at Bewley, still looking incredibly young. Note the same pose as 1969. Chitty went on display at Bewley, and at his Lordship's request, I wrote the history and information about the car that featured in the display. Here I am again. Well, oh, no, the same pose. And here are some more photos taken at Bewley in 1992. Now, there's a very pretty little blonde girl sitting in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That is my daughter, Catherine. Catherine, would you stand up for a moment? As, as you will see, she hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> Just like me, really, I suppose. Okay. Um, now, there's Catherine again, but this time she is in one of the film cars. That is a film chitty, chitty, bang, bang. Wonderful. And there is a placard that I actually wrote, which was the brief history of all the chitties, and that too was displayed at the time. There is a lovely photograph, if you can see it, of the original Chitty Bang Bang next to one of the film chitties. Again, the 1992 display of the National Motor Museum. Following a stint at Bewley, Chitty went to the Brooklands Museum and other venues, and she was finally returned to the USA where she stayed part of the Ohio exhibition. From Cleveland, Ohio, she moved to Maine, having been purchased by multimillionaire and philanthropist Bob Baer, that's spelled B-A-H-R-E. Bob had a magnificent car collection, the Bear Collection. I hope you can see that. There's just some of the cars he had. And there's another one. And there you can see Chitty 2. We'll come to that in a minute. His curator, one Jeff Orwig, affectionately known as Jeffo, contacted me in 2008. As I had heard the earlier email Cleveland to get an update on Chitty. Jeff and I kept in touch over the years, and then in 2019, my very good friend, him, Tim Raymond, made a rather good suggestion. Look, old boy, he said, <clears throat> you're about to hit three score years and ten, so you should do something special on your birthday in February. Why not go to America and be reunited with Chitty? Well, Tim does come up with some good ideas sometimes, so we thought, what a good idea. So we planned the trip. Jeffo was still in touch and up for a visit. The Bear Collection, I would point out, is a very private collection and only open to the public one day a year and only to people who live in the locality. Okay. We left these shores and headed to the USA, doing the tourist thing in Washington, New York, and Boston, which is where I got the t-shirt. And we picked up a car and then drove to Oxford, Maine, where a warm welcome awaited us. On the 22nd of February, 2019, my birthday, we spent the entire day and much of the evening with Bob Bear and his family, the ever-present Jesso and these fabulous cars in the Bear collection. Here we are with Bob, his wife Sandy, 
and son Gary, multi, multi millionaires perhaps, but truly delightful people, a lovely family. It was an unforgettable experience, and I donated the original Chitty Lockbook and many other historic documents and photos. They were really grateful. The car collection, as you saw, was fantastic. And to me, the obvious star in the whole collection was Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Okay, here I am, standing next to Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in 2019. Note the pose. This doesn't seem to change over the decades, does it? It's quite extraordinary. And there I am, at the wheel of the car. And there's my wife, Mary. Mary, would you stand up, please, so everybody can see you? That's it, this is my wife, Mary. Right. And here we have Chitty, Mary, and the great Jeffo. What a guy. He's amazing. We were told we would always be welcome back. Sadly, Bob Bear passed away some three years ago, about a year after we'd seen him. But the collection remains, and his wife Sandy and their two children continue to look after the cars and keep Jeffo busy. And so, what was the real Chitty Chitty Bang Bang? This or this? Now, I guess you have the answer. And I hope you found this presentation interesting. My profound thanks go unreservedly to Ian Ferguson of the Vintage Sports Car Club for allowing me to use the many photos in the book by David Wilson. This book. This is an amazing book, The Racing Zabrowski's. I actually helped David to find material for this book. He sadly is no longer with us. But it is an amazing book. And if you want to invest in one of these copies, they are available, obviously. And it's an extraordinary book, it really is. So I thank Ian Ferguson and those people for, in fact, waiving the copyright of this for allowing us to use these things for this presentation, which is wonderful. Thanks also to my very good friend, Mr. Tim Raymond. His amazing IT skills made all this possible. Wonderful. Thank you, Tim. Very grateful. But wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here is Jeffo again. Now... As recently as last Sunday, Jeffo sent me a little video, which I'd like you all to see. So this really is hot off the press. There's no question about it. Welcome everybody to the Bear Collection in Paris, Maine. You're looking at Chitty Chitty Bang Bang 2 in its current home. My name is Jeff, and your videographer is Norman. And we're going to share a little bit about the car that you are hearing about tonight um, from its current caretaker. You're looking at the massive 18.8 liter Benz aircraft engine from World War I that was dropped in this 1910 era Mercedes automobile chassis for the purposes of going fast. And you will or have heard about Count Louis Zabrowski. In essence, you're looking at his homemade race car from 1921. The exposed valve train on the top has no pressurized oil system, so you have to stop regularly to keep that lubricated properly. Here we have the massive front end, the radiator, frame, and everything of the early brass era Mercedes car. What we're looking at is a 1949 cosmetic, we'll say, restoration of an otherwise unrestored homemade race car built in 1921 as you see it. The aircraft engine placed in this chassis utilizing the original Mercedes transaxle and a special body built by Bly Brothers just for the purposes of this car. The car does have both its front and rear registration numbers. 
What makes this car really unique is uh, it's basically frightening to drive. It is one of the scariest automobiles I've driven ever, simply because it wants to go and it has no interest in stopping. And being that it's an aircraft engine, it is not a normal starting procedure. There is no fuel supply system other than a pressurized gas tank that is pressurized by air from a compressor on the engine, but it's only pressurized when it's running. So when it hasn't been running, you have to pressurize it. It also has an enormous top to bottom engine and there's no room for an oil pan. So the oil is in a torpedo shaped tank on the driver's side of the car. So before you start the car, you also have to pressurize the oil system. So to begin to get ready to start the car, up on the cowl there is a petcock to direct air from a hand pump one way or another. We start and put it on the oil side and we try and pump up some oil. So you've got to pump maybe two, three minutes to get a little bit of oil pressure built up. It doesn't last, but you can, you're at least getting oil to the system. Then you change to the other side with the petcock, and now we're going to pressurize the fuel tank. And there's another gauge on this side that shows any progress we may or may not make in that process. So you build up your left arm pretty well. And once you're ready to do that, we've got the spark control here on the column on the inside, and we've got the throttle on the outside. So we uh, retard the spark. And if we're confident, we still have air pressure for fuel and some oil pressure. With the batteries hooked up, we turn this and away she should crank and go. When it's warmed up, it has an aircraft magneto and you can just spin that and the creation of the spark with that magneto should make the engine fire up. To drive the car, there are four pedals. Maybe a little hard for you to see because it's dark down in there. The far right pedal is the left rear brake. The next second pedal in from the right, which is a smaller pedal, is the throttle, which is connected to the hand throttle on the steering column. The next pedal over to the left is the right rear brake. Uh, don't ask me, I'm not quite sure why that was a necessary feature on these cars, but it was. And then all the way over to the left is the, the clutch pedal. It takes two grown men to steer the car. So when you're going down the road and you feel like you need to slow down and go around a corner, you figure out which two pedals to put your feet on and you slam them down as hard as you can. And frankly, very little happens. So then you take one hand off of the steering wheel because over here we've got a, a fairly serious emergency brake and that actually causes the car to slow down. Unfortunately, I'm now stuck trying to steer a car with one hand that takes two. Both of my feet are busy trying continuously to press on the ineffective brake pedals and I'm pulling this brake back. I need help now to push in the clutch pedal and change gears. But what I've learned over time is it's almost impossible to stall this car so that you can stop, come near to a stop with the pedals and the handbrake before you can let go of the handbrake, grab the wheel, both hands steer, and push the clutch pedal in, and then change gears out here to the side. And then away you go. It is a hair-raising experience, but I've had it out on the road many times. I've only gotten it up to fourth gear once, and that was enough for me. And the roads here in Maine are not what I would call uh, comfortable cruising roads. So, one of the amazing things that's happened since we acquired this car was our visit uh, by Billy Hollis and Mary. They came to see us and to reconnect with the car because his father had owned the car for such a long period of time. But to our surprise, they brought us some unbelievable treasures of the history of the car. And I know he's giving you a rather wonderful presentation today but I just wanted to share with you some of the great treasures that we now own because he thought it uh, important that they stay with the car and we'll always be grateful for that. Here we have the original application for the number plates. These are all documents from 1930. 
Um, this was after the car had been um, acquired and I think made roadworthy. It was issued, these were its first registration, built in 21 but never registered in 1930. Again, a homemade race car. And then here is the tax disc for its first year on the road. Uh, next to that, we have its original um, registration logbook that is uh, pretty priceless when you have a car of this significance. And then a whole series of photos of um, Billy's dad's acquisition of the car and a subsequent engine rebuild with friends of his. And these are all dated between 1930 and then ultimately the final row of photos, they're dated, uh, the, th the third row of photos when uh, the, the restoration per se was finished or dated 1932. And there is the car as Billy's dad put it on the road in the early 30s. And he, of course, will tell you the rest of the story. We are honored to own this car. Um, the creator of this fabulous collection here in Maine was Bob Bear. Sadly, Bob Bear passed away uh, actually three years ago tomorrow. We'll be having a Remembrance Day for him. But he found out this car was available and started paying attention and negotiated a hard bargain. And we were able to acquire this somewhere around 2000, and I'm gonna say two, three, four, somewhere there. And uh, we have proudly taken care of the car. We took it to Pebble Beach. We competed in the large displacement engine uh, class. And believe it or not, even in its rather um, sort of unrestored state from 1949, we took second place, which was great in one respect, but that meant I had to drive it over the ramp um, around all those people, which was uh, a hair-raising experience, but I, I damaged no one and no vehicles in the acquisition of that award, so I'm very proud of that. So I hope you've enjoyed this little walk around. Uh, again, the car has a fabulous home, and if any of you ever find yourselves in the United States, up in the upper east corner in Maine. Uh, Billy knows how to reach me. We should reach out. I'd love to show you Chitty Chitty Bang Bang 2 in person. And that, folks, is the end. But I will be around all weekend. If anybody's got any questions, I'll be delighted to answer them or at least try to answer them. And I hope you've enjoyed it and it's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>